They're 0 and 6. No, no, not the Denver Broncos. They're 2 and 5, which means they've at least had success. The 0 and 6 record belongs to the groups trying to recall Democrats in the state legislature and the governor. This afternoon, the recall attempt against Senate President Leroy Garcia not only failed, but failed in spectacular fashion. Dave and Joseph drove from Pueblo with these Budweiser boxes to turn in petitions to recall Democratic Senate President Leroy Garcia. Let's stop here real quick. 13,506 valid Pueblo voter signatures were needed to get a recall put on the ballot. So how many signatures are in the beer boxes? Do you have 13,506 valid signatures? Um, we don't know. We have not counted. No. Why, why would you collect signatures, not know how many you're turning in, and then turn these into the Secretary of State? We promised our circulators and all our volunteers that we would follow through, and that's what we're doing. There were not 13,506 signatures in the boxes. There were three packets containing four signatures. Four. But Dave said there are more signatures left in Pueblo, petitions that were not turned in because if they were, they become a public record. And he was concerned with doxing, meaning someone posting the names and addresses online for all to see. Did they have more signatures? I don't know. At least when Dismiss Polis failed to turn in signatures to recall the governor, they brought boxes full of paperwork for us to see. Were those full of signatures? I don't know. What I do know is no state lawmaker is facing a recall election this year. I recall when recalls succeeded. It wasn't that long ago. In 2013, enough voters were upset with Colorado's new gun laws that they not only signed petitions to have a recall election of Democratic Senate President John Morse and Democratic Senator Angela Heron, they voted in that election to kick them out of office. A third Democratic Senator, Evie Hudak, resigned before the recall petitions against her were turned in. Three for three. Just like that. The Broncos, though, they appear to be a rebuilding period for politics. Earlier this year, Congressman Ken Buck won the election to be the chair of Colorado's Republican Party. When he won, he said, we will teach them how to spell recall. Recall is six letters. Six, the number of years ago that recalling state lawmakers was successful. Six, the number of failed recall efforts this year. Six, two more than the number of signatures turned in today. Six, the number of recalls that fairly have people asking, what happened to the money given to support the recall? And what happens to the information voters willingly gave up for groups unwilling to turn in the paperwork? New ballots were mailed out today for the 17,000 Aurora voters that live in Adams County. They're getting new ballots because there were inaccurate voting instructions for one of the Aurora City Council races. It told voters to vote for one candidate instead of two candidates. I want to be clear, not every Aurora resident will get a new ballot. If you live in the Aurora parts of Arapahoe County or Douglas County, your original ballot was printed correctly. But the Adams County hiccup leads to tonight's next question. Richard Kranz emailed us saying, one solution to the ballot typo is to just vote the original ballot and pick two candidates. Wouldn't that work? The short answer, Richard, yes. But if you do that, don't send in the new ballot. However, here's what the county clerk recommends. He wants voters to wait for that new ballot coming next week with the correct vote for two language on the Aurora at-large city council race. He wants you to fill that one out and shred the first incorrect ballot that says vote for one. But let's say you already sent in your first ballot with the incorrect wording. When you get your new ballot and you want to fix your vote, make sure to fill out every race again. Once you send in the new ballot, it will completely override the first one. The cost of the additional ballots is about 23000 It'll be split between Adams County and Aurora because both missed the error on the final proof. If you have a question about the upcoming election or anything else you want us to look into, send us an email, next at 9news.com, or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. We have a lot of sunshine in Colorado. We also have a sunshine law that gives you, the public, the ability to see how your government operates, how it makes decisions. There's a tiny town in the Eastern Plains that is testing how bright the sun shines. We've told you about the lawsuit against the Strasburg Fire Board for not voting to go into executive session. Now the board is cutting the public out in a different way. Steve Steger will catch you up on that after he recaps how we got here previously on Strasburg fires. And he's not in a position to do that. A concerned firefighter tells the news about a conflict of interest involving fire vehicle maintenance and the elected president of the fire board agrees not to bid for the vehicle maintenance contract again. Absolutely not. And just 24 hours later, Brad Jones was removed from his volunteer firefighting role 
It's a pretty bold move, canning a guy 24 hours after he was on television detailing problems involving public safety. For those of you who thought the story might end there, you were wrong. This Thursday night at the board's next regularly scheduled meeting, they voted to ban all methods of recording their meetings. And minutes after passing that, they called the cops on the man recording it. All in favor? All right, all right. Yes, the same guy who was fired for calling out the board, Brad Jones. He's also been recording the board's monthly meetings. Apparently, board members did not like that because minutes after passing these new rules, they sent one of their members into a back room and had him call the cops. 911. Hi, my name's uh, Brett Devlin. Um, I'm a board member here at the Strasburg Fire Department. Yep. He called 911. Okay, and what's he doing? Uh, he's just he's sitting up here. We uh, we actually made some rules that they're not allowed to have cameras in our meeting, and uh, he's up here and he's not taking his camera out of our meeting. The board ended up adjourning the meeting before law enforcement arrived, only passing a consent agenda and that new rule that no one can record a public meeting. Having a blanket ban like this seems pretty unreasonable. The policy concerns a lot of people, especially Jeff Roberts with the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition. If they're not doing anything wrong, if they're abiding by the open meetings law, why not let the public watch and listen? Today, the district wrote in a statement that the policy was created to address disruption, interruption, and interference of board proceedings, and that previous instances of recordings resulted in heated arguments and near violence on district property. But to advocates, two open meetings, it seems restrictive without reason. Why do the opposite of the transparent thing to do? For next, I'm Steve Steger. The attorney for Brad Jones told us today he's looking into options regarding the board's new policy, maybe even asking a judge for an injunction. The board's statement today said it will continue to refine the policy, possibly with appropriate restrictions on recording. Over the past couple of weeks, we've heard from a lot of you about RTD canceling bus and light rail service due to operator shortage. Well, now we know RTD is thinking about canceling certain routes altogether, and it's because they don't have enough bus or train operators. A spokeswoman for RTD told me a temporary service reduction would mean fewer operators would have to work mandatory six-day weeks, but it also means some may be waiting for a route that won't arrive. We are able to then provide the level of service that matches our current operators. And then hopefully we get more operators in, and then as we get more operators and we become better staffed, we're able to then restore some of that service. We talked with the union for RTD operators. The vice president told me he doesn't think cutting routes is the solution to the operator shortage because operators have more problems with RTD than just the six-day work weeks. Our complaint to them is you're worried about the type of shoes that I wear if I tuck my shirt in I don't tuck my shirt in and what you should be worried about is if I'm giving a safe trip to these patrons and, and treating them well while doing so. That's to me the most important thing. At the start of this month, RTD told us it was short 61 light rail operators. Next week, the RTD board will get a presentation on potential route cuts and then vote next month. When the first woman walks on the moon, she'll be wearing a spacesuit partially designed by a Colorado student. I started off in very humble beginnings and now being able to look at something that might be on every picture from the moon in a couple of years, that's a pretty humbling feeling. And a view from the cheap seats, adding video to our podcast from our resident Avs fans. And doggone it, if it isn't hard to get the lighting perfect on that scenic shot. Next. If you're going to go to Rocky Mountain National Park in the fall and not take a picture of the fall colors, it better look like the most Colorado thing we saw today. 
Next viewer Dustin saw a doggy photo shoot in action. A woman taking pictures of a very good boy or good girl sitting calmly in front of a very Colorado backdrop. And stop shouting at the TV about the dog being so close to the edge. Look at the photographer's foot. It's standing on the end of the leash. And as a dog owner, I can tell you that's sometimes stronger than holding the leash itself. Then again, I have a dachshund. What's the most Colorado thing you've seen today? Share pictures of it by using the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. If you want to head up to the mountains this weekend, an approaching cold front is going to change things up for us. We've got snow and fire danger from it. Fire danger will continue to be high across southern Colorado with a red flag warning in effect Saturday for locations from Colorado Springs all the way down into Trinidad. Wind gusts to 45 miles per hour coupled with low relative humidity will keep that fire danger in that part of the state high. But the same cold front also produces snow. This could mean it takes a little longer to come down the mountain on Sunday because Saturday night and through noon Sunday, snow showers will be impacting our northern and central mountains. We've got a winter weather advisory in effect. The areas along the continental divide could get four to ten inches of new snow, four to eight inches of snow falling around Vail. Snow mass in Aspen, lower elevations closer to Eagle and around I-70 could get one to four inches of snow as that system moves through. And then it's out of here, but it's still windy behind it. And on Sunday, we've got a fire weather watch that does include the Denver area. Our gusts could get up to 45 miles per hour. It will be cooler Sunday with highs in the low 50s, but 50s and 60s on an October weekend, not too bad as we approach Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday will stay mild as well. Becky, I'm helping out with the Rock and Roll Half Marathon on Sunday. I need you to get rid of the wind, please. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I can do that. All right, thanks. Sorry. Podcasts are generally pod only, audio. That's not how we get down here at Next. From the Cheap Seats is a podcast for Colorado Avalanche fans produced by and starring our Steve Steger and producer Jeff Sautel, who also happen to know how to work a video camera. They have season tickets to the Avs in literally the cheapest seats available, hence the name. Tonight we're giving you an extended look at what they've been up to. Thanks for coming in. I can't believe we have you in the Cheap Seats podcast. It's awesome. pretty impressive. Yeah, awesome. Thanks uh, for having me. How on earth do you get involved in the emergency backup goalie program? If you hang around for long enough, eventually you're going to get a shot. And So you're saying I've got a chance? You definitely have a chance. <laughs> that is the great thing about this emergency backup role. I don't know what I, I don't know who I have to pay under the table to get the nacho cam to go. I'm telling you, we'll make it we'll make it work. What's the most common thing you play? Um I a lot of clappy stuff. So, things to get people to clap. So, uh... Do you have a like pre-signed contract that I'm available to do this, or do you actually sign it in the locker room while you're getting dressed? I think you sign it in the locker room while you're getting dressed because we've all heard about the Scott Foster story. Yeah. Like I'm sure you guys are familiar the with Chicago that. Chicago Blackhawks, right? I mean, how do you live up to that now? Like the guy goes in and <laughs> stops all seven shots, and it's like, well, great, you know? Like, what do the fans mean to you guys? Oh, I mean, listen, I I say it all the time, and I I try to explain to the fans how much they mean to us, but it's hard to put into words, but. But listen, without them, it wouldn't be the same. And this dream job that we have wouldn't be the same. So, Why devote so much time to something like that? Honestly, like, I just, I just am a big fan of Tyson Berry. I mean, he helped me through a lot of things personally, just kind of like by being who he is as like a person, as a hockey player. I mean, he's a very unique guy. Cheap plug time for cheap plug for the from the cheap seats. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. A new episode drops like a puck on Tuesday. And if you have a great as fan story, even if it's not so great, you can email the show cheap seats at 9news.com. It's out of this world. Really? The work of a CU student will soon be used outside of this world. I came in. Ten weeks later, we had a design for lights and camera for the spacesuit. It's a part of history that will take us to the moon and back. You can see everybody's decorating. You can see everybody's getting excited. And it's Friday, the day after Thursday Night Football. We definitely need your good news. There's a lot of attention on NASA today because of that first all-female spacewalk. Well, when the first woman walks on the moon, they'll do so in the next generation of spacesuits that had a bit of help from CU. A graduate student at CU Boulder had his hand in the design. Our Byron Reed has the story of how his work has come full moon, I mean full circle. 
right click on that. Ever since he was growing up in Germany, Patrick Pischulti has looked for ways to feel at home. For me, moving around, I had to get comfortable in new places, and I really realized that for me it's important about how I feel in the space that I'm in. Pischulti is in his first year graduate school at CU Boulder, studying to be an aerospace engineer. I always was fascinated about great challenges and exploring. Last summer, he was an intern for NASA in Houston, Texas, where he was given a unique opportunity. I worked in the informatics group, and this informatics group is responsible for creating new lights and the camera for the new spacesuit. Pashulti helped work on NASA's new spacesuit designed for lunar exploration. His work is being incorporated into the suit's helmet lights. So on the spacesuit, you have these big bulky lights at the moment. So the, we went in and changed it to an LED design that was very small and very efficient. A mission that gave them 10 weeks to come up with a new design for the lights and a camera. If you watch real footage from the ISS, you can see that sometimes the video gets real grainy, it cuts out. So now uh, we went in and we switched out the processor, used a different lens that is more fish eye type. A little bit of work, Pashulti hopes, will help astronauts with the next moon landing. It needed to be small and it needed to be very efficient. So just a simple task. <laughs> and make them feel comfortable in a new place. And now being able to look at something that might be on every picture from the moon in a couple of years. For next, it's a very humbling feeling. I'm Byron Reed. NASA's new spacesuit is known as the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, also known as Spacesuit. They'll be worn to send astronauts to the moon by 2024 and other des destinations, including Mars. It's Friday night. We have to bleach our minds from that Broncos game last night. Your good news and your feedback next. It's been a long week, and there's no better way to end our Friday than with your good news. Photojournalist Corky Scholl caught up with some business owners on East Colfax getting into the Halloween spirit. It's Halloween. It's October. It's a fun month. My good news is Halloween is coming and I love Halloween. My good news is that we were able to get six local bars here on East Colfax to join together to decorate for Halloween and an attempt to make some money for six different local charities. My good news is I get to be a part of raising some money for uh, the Walk MS. Halloween is a great time that, as a bar, the adults get to be kids. <laughs> There's a lot of Halloween on, uh, on Colfax all the time, I think. Actually, it's kind of a, a weird thing. Because it's Colfax. I mean, it's a color of Colfax. Uh, you know, you get every walk of life, and then now you get to disguise it with ghosts and goblins and, and creatures of the night. It's just a fun holiday. You can be somebody else. My favorite Halloween memory, honestly, is I'm from originally from California, and it's seeing Oingo Boingo every year. <laughs> I do look forward to Halloween. It's just a great time of the year. Feedback time. Rich wants to know how the driver shortage for RTD affects the date of the start of the Longmont train. Well, they've got 11,034 days to figure it out. Debbie wrote in congratulating me for the show and my tie tack, but she only mentioned one. You might need to go back and watch the entire show. At least it'll tide you over until we're back next time.